session. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Georges Benjamin. I'm the executive director of the American Public Health Association and a member of the National Academy of Medicine. Um, and I have the honor of serving as um, a coordinator, of, uh, one of our two coordinators for this section today. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our two um, program chairs, um, Sarah Rosenbaum and Dr. Neil Paul for their work um, with our, our committee um, to pull this um, conversation together for us today. Uh, we basically have four panels for you and um, our speakers will address really key areas um, to talk about this issue of COVID lessons for US policy and health equity. Remind everyone this is a public session, um, but the members that are involved here will be able to engage um, each other um, primarily through the chat box. And um, at the end of those four um, targeted um, presentations um, with panel members, um, Dr. Neil Poe will um, pull together a conversation at the end for us to, um, to talk about uh, this, um, uh, the things that we've heard and to engage in this. Um, with that, let me, um, that brief introduction, let me um, turn this over to um, the first moderator, which is Risa Lavisa More. Risa. Great. Thank you, Georges. Uh, I'm Risa Lavisa More, and uh, I want to welcome our first panelist, Elizabeth Rosenthal. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, anyone who has read uh, your work and followed your tweets knows that you have been um, critically assessing how our nation has done with the pandemic since the early days. And in fact, you were at the epicenter when uh, this first started. So I'm wondering if you would just reflect a bit on the things that you observed in those early days. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, and I think there are a lot of challenges. Um, you know, to, I, I wrote a piece very early on in the uh, pandemic saying that um, this was a stress test for a health system and uh, we got an F and I still think that and I think we are continuing to do so. Um, uh, you know, I, I actually live in DC, but I am a New Yorker. So I was very familiar. My mom died of COVID in a assisted living facility there at the very beginning of the uh, pandemic. But, um, you know, I think what we saw and what strikes me most is that we have trusted a, um, a mostly private and siloed medical system to deal with a public health emergency, and it did a terrible job. Um, you know, one little example is people were always coming to me at the beginning of the pandemic saying, why don't these hospitals have ventilators? And I'm like, well, you know, they don't make any money by having a, a storeroom full of ventilators in the basement that they never have to use um, or that they hope never to have to use. You know, they fundraise for, uh, you know, new cancer wings and a, a new atrium, but they don't fundraise for ventilators, right? And I think one of the things the pandemic exposed very early on is that um, we have neither an, an intra-hospital or a national system for dealing with those kinds of problems. So, you know, what's the solution? We have, um, we have cruise liners. We say you have to have lifeboats and life vests, even though you hope never to sink. So one of the solutions is we say as part of all the Medicare money you get, you have to be prepared in this way for this bad thing you hope will never happen, or we have to have a genuine national stockpile. So that's just one tiny example. Um, you know, I know you mentioned that um, New York and how bad it was there in the early months, but I actually think, and you know, Elmhurst Hospital was in crisis for, from, but I actually think we were incredibly lucky in some ways that it started in New York because New York actually is one of the few cities that still has a robust public hospital system that was through HHC transferring patients between and among hospitals, 
um, that even took on, um, and uh, uh, you know, one of my former med school classmates, Mitch Katz, now runs that system, even took some of patients from the smaller privates that didn't, that weren't part of a big system or were part of a big system, but the mothership wasn't willing or able to take patients from its satellite hospitals. So I think, you know, I now live in Washington, DC. If that had hit here, where there is essentially no public hospital at the moment, it would have been an even greater disaster. So I think that's the first challenge. So let me get you to reflect a little bit more on what you've observed over the course of, you know, this nearly two years. Um, we've had vaccines come into play. We've had testing kind of wax and wane, lots kind of, of yeah. different hot spots. You've mentioned some of the uh, observations about what goes on in other parts of the country. But as we tee things up for this larger discussion, what are some of your other observations about what's happened over the course of the pandemic and in different places? Well, I think two different things are, are there are major flaws we've seen. I mean, we at KHN with um, uh, AP did a wonderful series, which just won a big award on Friday, I have to say, um, uh, for investigations right. and data work called Underfunded and Under Threat. And it looked at the hollowing out of public health systems in this country post 9-11, where we turned much of our attention to international terrorism and took money away from things like public health. So these health departments were really under-resourced and under attack. And so what we found was that uh, 248 top health officials in 42 states quit during the pandemic because they just didn't have the resources to do the basic things we, we know need to be done. And I know, you know, the CDC is the gold standard of, you know, public health in the world and stuff like that. But I think we've discovered that it's really good at the science but not that doesn't translate into on the ground public health. That's one bucket of lessons. The other bucket I think for me was, um, you know, we have again and again trusted the market to give us what we need and the market has been slow and, and, um, and very expensive to do that. So you look at testing, which is my prime example. You know, other countries had, uh, the University of Washington had to test very early on. But we had no way to um, expand that to a national testing system. It took us way, way, way too long to get tests out there. And I know everyone focuses on the reagent at the CDC that was flawed, but it's much bigger than that. It's that, you know, what did they do in South Korea, which is also a, has a, they went to the private sector and said, we will pay for this test if you make it, we'll pre-buy it. And it worked and these companies made tests. What we did is we kind of muddled around. We tried to do it through the CDC. Then we opened it up to other labs that had good tests. They were perfectly good tests, um, but then they had to go through procedures. And then, you know, when we had a test, I think the most telling thing is Medicare said we'll pay, I think initially, I can't remember the exact number, a hundred bucks. And the lab said, oh, that's not enough. So we didn't have enough tests. And then we didn't have enough turnaround time because we have some degree of the big labs capture the business, like LabCorp and Quest, that know how to go through the FDA, CDs, the FDA hoops. Um, so even though smaller labs could be doing it with quicker turnaround, um, LabCorp and Quest which had contracts with many of the big hospital systems. So those systems were required to send their PCR tests to LabCorp and Quest. Then we had you know, these ridiculous 12 to 14 day turnaround times. So we failed there um, in trusting that the market would respond or, or relying on the normal um, market incentives and procedures to get us what we need. And I think we're seeing that again with rapid tests now, which is so distressing to me because, um, you know, I think it's great that, you know, the president allocated a, a billion dollars to, to rapid testing. I think it's great that we're now seeing a few more coming on the market. Uh, go on Amazon. You cannot buy them for use at home. These are the home test kits. Um, 
and we're all celebrating that this is coming down the pike. You know, kids who were at university in England at Oxford last Christmas got at-home tests to take home with them so they could test themselves before they came back to university in January. So um, we need a better way to do this and it, it's gonna require big structural change in the way we think about public health. So that's a perfect lead into the next question I wanted to ask because you've in both this, these comments and other, other things you've written, highlighted um, some of the ways in which the public health system is, is wanting. And a lot of it comes down to not having an appropriate uh, surge capacity, which was really obvious in, this, in these last few months. Um, I thought we were supposed to have fixed that. Um, we, we have a panel that's gonna deal with it, but what went wrong? Give us your perspective. Well, um, I, I think, you know, there are processes in normal times which were enacted for very good reasons. And um, we just kind of went through those in not normal times and they take a long time. You know, I, I, like I said, I moved from New York, uh, from the New York Times five years ago down to DC. So I now, from New York, I was like, why does this stuff take so long? Like, this is an emergency. Why can't Congress do this? Why can't the FDA do this? The CDC, you know, there are deliberative processes that were put in place um, often a uh, hundred years ago for really good reasons, but we need a way to kind of go around them when there's an emergency. I think that's, that's one observation. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, the Obama administration rightly spent, uh, I think, got billions of public money developing a um, electronic health record system. And yet uh, the CDC was still, you know, faxing paper records back and forth. And, you know, governors who needed ventilators were, you know, kind of, it was like a bazaar, you know, calling different companies, seeing if they could find, uh, you know, a, a ventilator. And then here's the market going again even if they could find one, they, it was a question is, could you pay the price? Are you a rich governor from a rich state that can pay triple the normal price for a ventilator or can't you? So, um, you know, the market is a terrible way to respond to a public health emergency. Now, the one place it worked, and I, 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 I you know, I'm reluctant to say it this way because I think in some respects we overpaid, was Operation Warp Speed, where we said, we are going to buy these vaccines if you make them, right? We will, and we bought from everyone and anyone. So we now have excess capacity of vaccine, but we did get some really good vaccines out of that. Now, that is a model. I would argue it should be modeled. It, it could be a model that didn't require the amounts of money spent that, the, you know, I, I'm somewhat dismayed as someone who is not in the corporate world that, um, you know, uh, you know, saving the country or, you know, winning a Nobel Prize isn't enough incentive anymore for for some folks to uh, to to, uh, you know, step up to the plate and do what's needed. But um, I think we need to decide what's a reasonable incentive and and not be bartering or bargaining when we're in the midst of a public health emergency, which is what we were left to do. Well, of course, you know, this lays bare a bigger set of issues that you've written about quite a lot, which is uh, the ways in which our, our financing of healthcare and mm -hmm. the incentives that it provides is part of the problem. And you've spoken a little bit about that now, but give us a little bit more of your thoughts in this area. Well, I, I, you know, personally, I think we should be asking a lot more of hospitals for the money that the federal government gives them and be more specific uh, about what we want, uh, particularly from not-for-profit hospitals in the way of uh, community benefit and charity care. I mean, what we saw in New York during the early pandemic, which I think was really horrifying. And I'm, I be, you know, because of my work, I've become the repository of everything people in, in healthcare see that bothers them um, is that 
if you were um, part of a big hospital system that often had uh, a flagship hospital and you know satellite hospitals that dealt with the underserved, you got really much, much better care at the flagship hospital and much, much worse care at the community hospital that in theory, that hospital is part of its network. It gets great benefits because it sends residents there for training. But um, it, it really is a two, if not more than two tiered system. And I think um, that that's really a problem. So that's one area where I think we shouldn't just say, uh, you know, we expect community benefit and list what you're doing on a 990 form. We should say, well, what do we actually want you to do? What do we think is real community benefit? for our communities. I think some of that is like the lifeboat example, you know, we yeah. don't we, we don't give cruise ships the option of like, you know, well, do you prefer to upgrade your dining hall or have lifeboats? We say you need to have lifeboats. Exactly. So, you know, um, you've talked about some of these inequities, particularly between the community hospital and, and the, the mothership, so, so to speak. The pandemic has laid bare a lot of other inequities yeah. that we've long known existed. But what's been different is the, uh, the real world and real time window into these, it, these inequities. Um, and we're gonna talk a fair amount about that at, uh, over the course of this panel. But, but what I'd like you to do is kind of set the stage and give us your perspective on on, uh, on some of those inequities and, and then we'll turn to maybe what we can do about some of them. Uh, sure, I mean, you know, if, if you were uh, initially, if you were underserved, underinsured, uninsured, um, you know, those people in our world today are afraid to interact with the healthcare system. So if you're getting sick with COVID or getting sick with anything, you wait too long because you know, it hasn't served you well for decades now. So, um, I, and I do think that comes into vaccine hesitancy as well. Um, you know, in a KFF survey recently, the, the biggest predictor of not getting vaccinated was if you are uninsured, even though the vaccines are free. And I think that's because people who are uninsured or uninsured don't trust our medical system. And they shouldn't because it hasn't served them well. So I, I think uh, there's that aspect, you know, then even when testing, uh, which, was, which, which was a good thing, was at no cost to patients, um, you know, that made it widely available. But what we see now is um, even that's politicized in the places that don't want to know how much COVID is around don't make testing very available. In New York, you can get tested like you would go into a convenience store and buy a bottle of uh, you know, water. It's, there are vans all on uh, every few blocks and it's no cost. Um, so I think there's just this great, um, uh, you know, do we need a national health system? That's, that's a political decision. I'm a journalist. If I want to keep working is one, I can't say anything about it. But I do think we need uh, national standards, at least, of what a health system should be, what a public health department should do, and, and much better um, communication between them and, and the center. Because, um, you know, every little public health department was out there doing its thing mightily, you know, and they, these were often really the unsung heroes because they were, um, you know, they were under-resourced and often being threatened for what they were doing. Uh, so, you know, and then there's the, the uh, diverse communities that um, often got different care. It, it largely had to do with what hospital you had access to. Did you have a primary care physician? What, you know, again, you know, what have your past interactions been with this system? And that was all magnified as people got sick, got scared and decided whether to get vaccinated or tested. And it's still going on. I mean, that's the thing that shocks me. You know, almost two years later, it's the same story playing out again and again. 
So um, last question, as we prepare to turn this over to the next panel, um, you're journalists and I understand you're not going to um, tell <laughs> us what policies might yeah. be in, enacted or should be enacted, but what are the things that you're gonna be watching over the next uh, six months to a year that you think would be policy innovations or solutions that could help us be better prepared um, the next time we're facing something like this. Hopefully it, it won't be of the magnitude we faced in the last couple of years, but what, what are you gonna be watching and reporting on over the next few months? Well, I think one thing that that is, uh, you know, because there's the things that I think should, of course, happen, but politically now I understand they never will, or maybe never will, um, a, a true national medical record system where the CDC and hospitals and nursing homes and labs all communicate with each other. Um, one of the problems with nursing homes is many of those patients were plugged into different hospital EHRs. So which are siloed, you know, that that is a crime. It's a crime that when I got an MRI this year, I had to like get a floppy disk from one hospital and take it to another. That shouldn't happen. So that's a simple thing where you can track disease better, you can coordinate better. Um, I, I do think um, I would like to see us, as I, I've said way before the pandemic, think about the price we pay for things and um, make sure that, uh, you know, yes, yes, a reward can be an incentive for new drug development uh, or a test development, but it should be commensurate with the benefit we're getting and it shouldn't be limitless. So I really think we need to rethink the FDA processes and our patent processes for, for much of what we do. And then I, I think the big thing is we need to get um, a, we need to get people plugged into a medical system, whether, it, and so many people aren't. And, and uh, you know, because, um, and, and that includes both diverse, uh, underserved and relatively well-off patients now. You know, I don't have my, my kids who are in their twenties, you know, they're like, oh, we can just go to urgent care. And I'm like, no, you need a primary care doctor. You need a system that you're plugged into and that serves you well, that treats you, you know, not everyone needs a private room and, you know, a, a designer gown, but everyone needs to get good health care. And when people talk to me about, is this a right or a privilege? I, I just always say, that's the wrong discussion. It's something you need. It's something you need like water, like heat, um, if you're nine months pregnant, you need to deliver. If you have crushing chest pain, you need a place to go that you trust. So I think we need a minimum standard of health care for everyone in this country, whether that's through Medicare for all, through expanding Medicaid, um, through demanding it of our uh, hospital systems. But I think it's that what the pandemic has showed me is that we need to get people to trust and to be integrated into healthcare in our country. And it's not, and I think that's why you see in other countries, whether it's a public health system or not, um, you know, you look at Israel, uh, the European countries who, but European countries who got vaccines after us, but their vaccination rates are much higher. And I think it's because they trust that their net, that their health system, public or private is, it's doing the right thing for them because that's been their experience. And that's not been our experience for many people. Great, thanks. A lot Liz. to do, sorry. <laughs> well, you've covered a lot and given um, the panels that are gonna follow a lot to um, jump off on, uh, thank you again. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Georges, for the next, uh, next panel. Thank you. Thank you, doctors. I appreciate it. That was a, a great conversation. So now I'm going to turn it over to our second panel. Um, we have two co-moderators, uh, Dr. Rebecca Gee and uh, Dr. David Ash. Rebecca, David, it's all yours. George, uh, it's so great to be with you and, and Elizabeth and Risa. Thanks for that wonderful panel. Um, I am now uh, CEO of LSU Healthcare Services, but formerly Secretary of Health for Louisiana, where I led the Medicaid expansion. And 
had the opportunity to travel the state and see inequity in all of its forms, unfortunately, um, had things said to me like, well, we got rid of our Medicaid day because we didn't like how our waiting room looked with those patients in it um, and their children, especially with their McDonald's dipping sauces. So, you know, as I traveled Louisiana and saw that, I saw the segregation of care, historical systems that were segregated, um, I became um, even more emboldened to try to tackle inequities, and that's what the uh, nature of this panel is. We're going to talk about what happened in hospitals in particular during COVID, uh, and what, what were the inequitable um, areas that we all witnessed, and how we have addressed them, and where are those bright spots that we have all seen, and what are the positive deviations in our health systems um, we have an, a, that we've seen that have really moved forward at, at uh, at, as a catalyst because of COVID. So I wanted to um, start off with, with this wonderful panel and not take too much time, but to say, look, when, when I founded the Office of Health Equity at the Health Department in 2018, it was the first one in the Deep South in a health department. It was an unpopular thing to do. I was told at that time, maybe it wasn't good politics, um, maybe it wasn't needed. And as Riza so well mentioned, uh, COVID has given us a real world window into inequities and what's been, a, uh, I think, um, a silver lining of COVID is that it's no longer confusing to the majority of people that inequities exist or that they need to be addressed. And um, as part of our work here at LSU, I helped co-chair the Task Force on Disparities and Health Equity that the governor then created. Um, and we mentioned, um, out of this work, there were two um, really tangible suggestions. One, it gets to what, something that Elizabeth said, is that, is that community benefit dollars really need to be held accountable. There need to be metrics for them. There needs to be a framework for them. Uh, we need to figure out how to use them uh, to reduce inequities. And, and those are a big opportunity, I think, post-COVID to think about how we improve the health and lives of lower income Americans and improve community health. But we also looked at crisis standards of care. And, and as was mentioned by Elizabeth as well, it was shocking to see this eBay type environment where the highest bidder won and there was complete confusion about you know, who would get life-saving treatment, who would get life-saving masks, how would you get a ventilator? Um, it was appalling that, that things were so confusing and so inequitable. And we continue to see inequitable Care. We continue to see in Alaska most recently crisis standards of care being um, utilized and not um, what we realized was that these crisis standards of care are not being um, uh, practiced even if they're in place. And so what happens is that people get inequitable access. And so I think that's another opportunity for us to address um, going forward. And, and by the way, we should have addressed it by now. We're already way behind the times in terms of how do we respond to the data failures, to the inequity, inequities, and to um, making sure that when someone goes to a hospital, they get what they need when they need it. Um, but I'm gonna move next to Leo Swanee. Leo is the Senior Vice President and Chief Academic Officer for Auctioner Health. He's also a pulmonary critical care doc. Um, uh, we were after New York State and Washington and Louisiana, the third state to really get hit hard. We had at one point the highest uh, uh, rates of COVID rise in the world, um, and we were extremely um, concerned that we would run out of resources. Um, Auctioner really has been at the center of this. Auctioner has led much of the work in terms of providing vaccines, including to our own clinical staff here before we could get them ourselves. Um, and you and your research team found a difference in COVID death rates between uh, individuals who are black and white in Louisiana. And these were explained in part by pre-existing disease, which I think are also explained by uh, inequitable access to uh, social and other services. So I wanted Yulio to talk about the chronic diseases that you identified that have so much to do with poverty. And then what has Auctioner done during the pandemic to fight the poor drivers of the drivers of poor health in communities of color? And what do you plan on doing going forward? It's great to have you with us, Leo. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gee. I uh, appreciate the, the, the panel having me talk about our journey and our story. And as Dr. Gee pointed out, unfortunately, I live in Louisiana. I grew up in Louisiana, and, and Louisiana traditionally has had one of the worst health outcomes of all 50 states. So even before the pandemic, 
Ochsner as an anchor institution in the state as the largest healthcare provider in the state of Louisiana with over 40 hospitals and clinics, as the uh, a thousand unique patients that we care for in the state of Louisiana, uh, a, thousand, a million unique patients we care for in the state of Louisiana, and I was the, the largest private employer in the state of Louisiana with over 35,000 employees. We had pledged to improve the health of Louisiana from the traditional rankings of 50th to 40th in this decade. And so that was work that we had started before the pandemic. And as Dr. Gee pointed out, New Orleans was one of the original epicenters along with New York and uh, Seattle because of Mardi Gras that took place in February of 2020 became an incredible super spreader event. And our hospital system started admitting 50 patients uh, uh, an evening. Um, uh, during that rapid rise. And so one of the early observations we made was this was a disproportionate amount of Black patients that were being admitted uh, with COVID-19. Uh, so that led to our retrospective cohort study where we looked at the first 3,500 patients uh, in the state of Louisiana that tested positive for COVID within the Oxford Health System. And as one of our previous speakers uh, had pointed out, the CDC did not have testing. It was completely uh, inadequate testing. So Oxford as a health system, we developed our own testing. We actually had our own PCR lab up and running a week after our first patient was admitted because we could not rely on the CDC uh, for testing. That allowed us to be on the front runners of the testing in the state of Louisiana, which allowed us to do this retrospective cohort study. What we found was that of those first 3,500 patients that tested positive, 70% were black, although the state of Louisiana's uh, demographics uh, show that 30% of the state's population is black. Um, we also found that 77% of the patients hospitalized in the first wave were black. Uh, and although not only is just 30% of the population in, in Louisiana black, the patients that uh, in our health system that we care for is about 31% of the patients we care for are black. So obviously a disproportionate number there. When we dug a little deeper to look at what was driving these inequities, it was just a classic example of the social determinants of health uh, and these long existing health inequities in the state of Louisiana. We found that blacks disproportionately had higher rates of comorbidities and chronic disease like hypertension and diabetes and chronic kidney disease, uh, all known well before COVID, just highlighted more in COVID. We found that uh, along with the black race being a significant risk factor for being admitted to the hospital, uh, other factors like if you were on public insurance, uh, you had increased risk of being hospitalized. If you lived in lower, uh, um, socioeconomic areas, you had increased risk of, of being hospitalized, as well as the more uh, traditional ones, which were the comorbidity risk for being hospitalized, uh, uh, including obesity. Um, what have we done? What has this, this, this data done for an anchor institution like Oxford? So, well, I think it's, 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 it's accelerated our efforts to try to address health inequities and realizing and we again, I, we had already launched this healthy state initiative to improve the health and wellness of the citizens that we serve. And so this just really kind of became a catalyst uh, and ultra focused on health inequities. Uh, so we have launched the Ochsner Xavier Institute for Health Equity and Research. That's in partnership with Xavier University of New Orleans, which is a historically black university, has a long history uh, of working in this area and this field and a lot of expertise. Um, through that, we've launched the Equitable Vaccine Task Force. And so I'm proud to say that when we look at the percentage of patients that we as a house system have vaccinated, it's 30% it's are black and about 5% are Hispanic, which now mirrors the population of Louisiana, but that's not by accident. That is because we've done a lot of community engagement and community partnerships and work through this equitable vaccine task force. We had an equitable research task force to make sure we had equitable representation in our research trials before COVID, but this has again reinforced and reinvigorated our work in that area and our partnership with our communities. We've launched 13 uh, committed to, we've now started three committed to starting 13 community clinics uh, in, in communities uh, 
we chose those communities specifically by looking at where were the patients that were visiting our emergency rooms that did not have a primary care physician? And I don't think it would be a surprise to, to, to uh, uh, those on this webinar to know that those tended to be in areas with uh, lower socioeconomic communities. So those, like I said, we have three launched today with a commitment to launch 10 more throughout the state of Louisiana. And those community clinics are in partnership with the community. Um, and we've been on listening tours and partnering with them and really sticking to the nothing about us without us and making sure that is those community clinics are true partnerships. Um, and then the last thing I, I want to just point out that, that we've tried to focus on is, is really leveraging some of the digital capabilities that we've developed. We've developed digital capabilities to manage chronic diseases like hypertension and diabetes. Uh, and we have a connected mom program. Uh, there's been good data on this uh, um, in, in, in our Medicare population in our private sector. So now we've launched this in the Medicaid population with early really good success um, to improve health. And I think our, these, these, these are just innovative novel ways to approach uh, long-standing uh, um, health access issues for uh, certain populations. So. That's just an example of, kind of of what our observations, what we've done, and what a what a integrated health system. And listening to the previous panel of what an integrated health system on an electronic platform can really leverage and bring, and a health system that's committed to being an anchor institution. So I thank you for your time. Leo, thank you. I think your the efforts were impressive, and and you have been a phenomenal leader. But also, it's been wonderful to see the doctor understands that income and housing and the economic realities of life predict health. And you've been involved in a lot of training programs and efforts with Xavier. And I'm very excited to see the outcomes of that. Thanks, Leo, for joining. And your study really found a difference, not in quality because you looked at auctioner system, but you found a difference in outcomes for black and white individuals. David, you're um, gonna join us for a second and talk about what you found in your study. David, you've been a mentor to me, my professor. Um, you have done phenomenal work that's outlined a, answers to a number of problems. Uh, and this work that you've recently published had some different findings uh, than, than that of Oxers because you focused on differential health systems. You looked at systems that were well-funded and systems that were not. And you concluded that perhaps the main reason that black patients tend to have worse outcomes than white patients is because they go to hospitals that provide worse care for all. So David, can you describe what you found, but also what solutions would you propose to address these inequities going forward and the differences in quality of care that lower income Americans experience from higher income Americans? Sure, well, well, thanks Rebecca. And Leo, I really enjoyed your remarks. And I think that your work really has been, has been so seminal in, in helping to identify the social determinants or the, that have sort of played out here, the social determinants of health. You know, last year has really stimulated an immense amount of research on race and on COVID and the connections between the two. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Rosenthal's comments about, um, in some respects, this being the same story also resonates with me. You know, there is, on a very general level, we have learned a ton, but there has not been a lot new of a very general format that we've learned over the past 20 months. We've observed, I think, the same kinds of interactions between race and health and healthcare that we've seen before, but there, of course, has been a lot more focus on this. Pretty much every scientist has turned his or her attention to COVID or to race or to both. And of course, the public has been very primed to be receptive uh, to those issues. So in, it, when the, in the first few months after the pandemic was declared, as Leo mentioned, we began to see you know, observations about the differential burden of COVID-19 by race, how it's acquired, how it's identified, how it's treated, what happens to individual patients or to communities. And along with some colleagues, as Rebecca noted, um, some colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and also United Health Group, we took a look at a more national sample of what was going on at the level of hospitals. And we looked at, um, I guess we examined about 40,000 patients at about a thousand different hospitals in just the first few months of the pandemic, looked at 30 day inpatient mortality or referral to hospice, which in the context of COVID is sort of like a mortality equivalent. And we were able to look at much more general trends across the nation. So I'll give you just a couple of highlights of what we found. First, the, 
the overall chance of death following inpatient admission. So these are sicker patients uh, for, for COVID was around 12% up through June of 2020. So just the first few months of the pandemic. Um, but there was a huge hospital to hospital variability in this outcome, even adjusting for many patient characteristics. So if you divide the 1,000 hospitals that we looked at into quintiles, the best performing hospitals had a mortality rate of around 9%, and the worst performing hospitals had a mortality rate of around 15%. And that difference between 9 and 15% is just an absolutely huge difference. And pretty, although pretty much all hospitals got better over time, still your chances of surviving COVID, if you were hospitalized for it, depended considerably on what hospital you went to, right? Your age and your comorbidities, of course, mattered, but the hospital that you went to mattered a lot. And hospital mortality wasn't associated with what you might think. It wasn't associated with hospital size or academic affiliation. Instead, the single factor that was most associated with higher hospital mortality was a high case rate of COVID in the community. And you know, maybe that's related to hospital strain, which is quite plausible, but the overall message is that the important outcome of mortality varied considerably um, by community, by hospital, and that outcome seemed to be most associated with what's going on in the county surrounding it. And that's a, like, that's a, it like echoes a lot of the social determinants of health story that we had heard even before COVID. Um, it's also, it's something that we've seen in cardiovascular disease. It's something we've seen in cancer. It's not unique to COVID. It's not really new. It just came out louder uh, in, the, in the context and people could hear it more. So then we looked sort of relevant for this panel. We looked at the effects on race. And so here we looked at about 45,000 patients, about 1200 hospitals. And again, looked at 30 day inpatient mortality. And what we found looking nationally is that black patients in general were much less likely to survive than white patients. But the size of that difference depended considerably on what else you were going to adjust for statistically. When you adjust for age and sex, the white patients had a mortality rate of about 12.8% and the black patients had a mortality rate of 14.8%. That's two percentage points higher. The higher rate of comorbidities in the black population explains some of the mortality difference. Leo already mentioned that the timing differences, right? Black patients were much more likely to be admitted in the early days of the pandemic when in fact care was not as good. That certainly contributed to some of the racial disparities we see. But the factor that contributed the most was as Rebecca mentioned, was that black patients tended to be admitted to hospitals with higher mortality rates for all patients, right? regardless of race. So our results are consistent with the conclusion that black patients did worse largely because they went to worse hospitals. And if black patients were admitted to the same hospitals where the white patients were admitted in the same distribution, our modeling suggests that they would have had roughly equivalent mortality rates. And so, you know, that is a, we've seen patterns like that way before COVID. This is a very tangled web. But if I had to point my finger at it, which potentially points to some solutions, it would really be the combination of this. First, the way hospitals are fin financed and funded and resourced depends considerably on the wealth and resources of their surrounding communities, right? Surrounding wealth affects the payer mix of hospitals and other resources like the education of staff. Second, in this nation, we have enormous racial residential segregation and the mortality differences we see we're easy to anticipate because that's pretty much how it always is. People go to hospitals that are close to them. This is the same circumstance we have with public education, right? So schools are largely funded by property taxes and other correlates of local wealth. And so the schools where people are wealthier are better resourced than the schools where people are poor. And this is like fundamentally unfair. Uh, so moving money around, it isn't going to make everything equal, but at least it might relieve some existing barriers to equality, the way we finance healthcare and the way we support education, frankly. So I know my time is up, so I'm going to conclude, you know, with, with something that I think will tee up what Edmondo and Madeline will say, uh, which is that hospitals can do something proactively uh, in the way that uh, Leo mentioned as well. Just because community effects are powerful doesn't mean that hospital leaders are powerless, right? There are things that they can do. It's not entirely out of their hands. And um, so I'll stop there because I'm eager to hear what Edmondo and Madeline will say, but thank you.
Thanks, David, and, and to your team at Penn that uh, did such fantastic work. Um, so next is Ed Mondo, who is a physician and the head of Moffitt Cancer Center's uh, Digital Enterprise uh, and the Digital Ecosystem. He works on consumer-oriented real-world solutions for clinical practice, research, education, and administrative processes. And uh, Edmonda, you've been a leader in the digital space in so many areas, and COVID has led to a renaissance in digital innovation. Have you seen digital innovations worsen disparities? And if so, how? And then what are areas where you think digital innovation and this bold new frontier can help uh, level the playing field, can change some of the things that David just discussed? Uh, and what are your hopes for digital innovation, uh, creating a, a better system, a more equitable system? I have so many hopes. Thank, thanks, Rebecca, for uh, for teeing that up, and, and thanks, uh, David and Leo as well. Um, so, you know, what what really happened with COVID vis-a-vis -vis digital health um, is that it it really accelerated the implementation of of digital tools and technology probably by years, if I'm being honest, probably by years um, in, a, in a very short matter of time. Now, why were we taking so long to get these in place? There's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but, but at the end of the day, um, it was a pretty significant acceleration, right? So at, at Moffitt, you know, we're, we're, we're the um, only NCI designated comprehensive cancer center in Florida. And, you know, we were, we had to take care of a lot of patients and, we, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, it just, you know, seeing patients in the clinic just didn't make sense. So we literally had a 7,500% increase in our virtual visits, for example. Um, and we basically got everyone working from home. So we got everyone who could work from home to work from home. And we did all of our, we did a good chunk of our visits, um, you know, virtually. Now, some of that's come back down since then, but there's still a, a higher baseline for both working from home and for the virtual virtual visits. Um, again, you can make an argument that, you know, virtual is not new. We should have been doing virtual visits five years ago, um, but we're, that's where we are now. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot. Of, so we, we, we basically have a new baseline in, in, in um, using new digital, uh, in you know, technology, we have a new, we knew kind of a new baseline around digital health. But what what might be the disparities around that? So what I what I'm concerned about, Rebecca, as you as you teed up that question, is um, this idea. Uh, you know, both Leo and David talked about you know social determinants of health, but is digital is a digital divide um, increasingly a social determinant of health? You know, you think about access to uh, digital tools technology, whether it's the device, whether it's broadband access, whatever it might be, you think about um, health literacy, but then you think about digital health literacy, um, which is different, uh, and, and, and how are we address, how are we even understanding, measuring, and intervening around that? And, and one thing that's increasingly becoming clear for me as I, as I think about you know, truly implementing uh, some of these digital tools is really poor design of the tool itself the software, the hardware, um, that doesn't really take uh, diversity and equity into account, right? So whether it's poor design because it's not inclusive of diverse populations or language uh, preferences or, or, or whatever it might be, that it's not, it's not designed for a broad enough population, um, which again, uh, can lead to exacerbating uh, disparities. The other thing I, I think that we, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention from a digital perspective in terms of disparities is, a uh, artificial intelligence machine learning, right? So I think a lot of folks think that we're going to be able to just land on on AI ML, and that's going to that's going to be the nirvana. Um, uh, and the the challenge with 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 AI ML is that you're basically training predictive models. It's predictive analytics. You're training these models, and what are the data you're using to train the model, right? So if you're using data that's not from diverse populations, guess what? You're not going to be very predictive. Um, in a diverse population. If you're training the model with, with data that's actually already biased at its core, you've just now codified and, 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 and built into your infrastructure, your data and uh, analytics infrastructure bias um, without even, without necessarily even knowing it, right? So I'm, that's a concern. It, it's a big concern and I'm, you know, I'm seeing it in, in, increasingly. I think we have an opportunity though, to your last part of your question and teeing that up, Rebecca, I think we have an opportunity 
to be proactive in leveraging uh, digital tools in healthcare to address disparities as opposed to exacerbating disparities, right? Whether it's, you know, um, again, measuring, uh, measuring uh, digital divide, developing interventions, um, designing digital tools with equity in mind. Um, better design is easier, is, is easier to use and really could, again, potentially address language barriers, literacy issues. You, act, you actually can design around those, some of those and actually um, de you can decrease some of the disparities around that. And again, with AI, I, I, I do think I am, you know, cautiously, I will say cautiously optimistic that AI ML can help um, from a bias and from an equity perspective. Uh, but we've got to be very disciplined about how we approach it. We've got to really think about training the model with diverse data. We've got to think about the transparency of the model itself. Can't be a black box. Really think about how we, how we uh, approach transparency. You have to think about testing the models for bias and just being, again, proactive about that. And then kind of an ongoing, um, you know, uh, uh, oversight approach to some of these predictive models. But I do think that there's great opportunity here. And if we're, if we're, proactive and disciplined. I think leveraging digital uh, can really help us address, um, um, you know, kind of decrease bias and really address equity. So again, cautiously optimistic on this front, Rebecca. Thanks, Edmondo. And I think as you so well state, you address bias by design, you know, what kind of data are you using in your models? And, but also how do you engage early with communities so that you'd establish that trust as you have so well done in so many, so many aspects of your career, Edmondo. Um, so thank you for sharing. I know there have been some questions. We're going to address many, as many as we can at the end. Uh, and I've appreciated the, the wonderful banter um, in the chat. Um, next, we're going to hear from Madeline Bell. She is one of my sheroes. Madeline began her career as a pediatric nurse at Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Now she runs that hospital, one of the top ranked children's hospitals in the US and best performing hospitals for kids in the world. Um, Madeline, um, you run. Um, CHOP and children in so many ways have been the collateral damage of this pandemic. Um, early in the pandemic, many had parents who were essential workers um, and, and in addition had multi-generational households and lacked proper protection. So many don't have a choice to get vaccinated because we don't have the FDA's uh, approval uh, for the children who are younger ages and then children are often uh, you know, relying on their parents who, to make those decisions for them, uh, even those who have access now. And so I would love to hear you talk about how you're seeing disparities play out in your system and what is CHOP doing to help address disparities in the community and help parents from every background protect their children. And thanks for joining us, Madeline. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I mean, because children were not um, hospitalized at the same level as adults it allowed us to turn our attention to um, children in the community and uh, especially underserved children. And one of the things that we recognized really early on is that we needed to give children um, access to the things that they would be missing because they weren't at school. Um, and the first was school lunches. And so the first thing we did was stand up, you know, sort of took the money that we normally use for some of our community programs that needed to be closed down because of the pandemic and we shifted those resources and those employees to providing school lunches um, for children in the school district of Philadelphia, which is one of the poorest school districts. Um, and then we uh, made sure we created um, testing centers in underserved areas like my other colleagues you heard from earlier. We partnered with a program that Comcast stood up to make sure that there was behavioral health, telehealth, um, psych psychiatric services um, for children in underserved areas. Our medical legal partnership team went into overdrive helping families navigate early on before some of the protections on um, rent and housing were put in place. And then once the, um, once the vaccine was approved, we vaccinated 19,000 school, Philadelphia school district teachers and daycare workers so that um, children could get back to school, daycare, and that parents could work. Um, I am one of those hospitals that David distinguished as maybe a hospital that has greater resources. To, so to sort of, you know, say what would what could one do as a leader if you were running a hospital that didn't have those resources? And I would say 
the most important service that I think that we provided to the community was knowledge. Our infectious disease physicians, our pediatricians really worked very hard with school districts. Um, some, I have to say, private school districts were the ones that were the noisiest, but we made sure we spent our time in the underserved school districts and um, daycare centers, helping the daycare centers to stay open. And these were daily conversations and um, I think a really important service. So, you know, if you don't have the resources to, you know, to vaccinate 19,000 teachers and daycare workers on using your own resources, or doing all the testing in schools, um, that is something I think that that um, a health system can provide. And then, you know, even though we went to a minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour four years ago, we certainly have employees that are lower income. And early on in the pandemic, we partnered with the YMCA to subsidize daycare for those who didn't have options. They didn't have you know, family members, they didn't have the ability to pay the extra money to put them in a different program. And we created a child care marketplace to help match people who may have, um, who, who weren't as busy that might have been able to help people who um, needed to be at the bedside and had child care responsibilities. So I think that, you know, our goal of trying to ensure that children were, um, back to in school learning, getting nutrition, you know, some of the basics um, throughout the pandemic. I would say the final thing is that the pandemic has had an outsized impact on children's emotional, behavioral, um, uh, uh, you know, abilities. And we um, are seeing across the country a significant increase of children um, coming to hospitals in with anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. And certainly telehealth has helped that and you know, partnerships to get telehealth to underserved communities. But um, it's an area that I am focused on and I think all the children's hospitals are, especially now because of what's happened with the um, pandemic in the last 18 months. Well, thank you so much, Madeline. So I, I mentioned in the chat, we won't have time for questions. We're moving on to a fully packed schedule, but uh, David, uh, Madeline, and Mondo and Leo, thank you so much for your leadership, uh, for sharing this, uh, these incredible stories and for your dedication to making sure that everyone has uh, the best shot at getting great healthcare. So thank you for joining us and really appreciate it. Uh, your expertise being shared uh, today. So I think now we're moving back to Georges, who will take it from here. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much. That was that was a, a wonderful conversation, um, uh, Dr. Yee. I appreciate it, uh, you and your panel. Um, so now I want to have a, a conversation um, with Dr. Mandy Cohen, who's the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Director. Um, and if he gets to join us, uh, Dr. Umar Shah, um, who's from the Washington State uh, um, Department of Health. He's a secretary there. I'm not sure he'll be able to join us this morning, but uh, Mandy, um, can you give us some of your I'm thoughts? On. Oh, you're here. Okay, great, great. Um, Mandy, if you could start, maybe just give us a couple minutes and then let Dr. Shaw um, come have a, some thoughts and then we'll, we'll have a conversation with you and two of you. Sure. Well, first, good morning, everyone. This has been a great conversation and really important and timely. So I thought I would share a few perspectives from uh, the state level, and I've I've led the COVID response in North Carolina the, um, this this whole time, and um, it's it's been a hard couple of years, and um, we are still learning lessons from it. So I'll try to um, summarize. I think the three places that I would leave you with in terms of what are the things I really think we need to do better as we think forward. Um, you've heard it a few times. The first is in our ability to understand what's what's happening in the world and that we need data. Um, I will say going into this, we were completely blind um, in data here in, in North Carolina. I didn't know what, what was happening. Obviously the limited testing was an issue, but even when testing did start, um, we did not have the tools in order to even know what testing was happening, who was getting tested. Um, 
and we we've come a long, long, long way from from that scary point with no visibility. But having the data systems from the beginning that would give us insight into this, right? You can't solve equity issues unless you can see them and measure them. So the first thing for me is about making sure that we have the visibility to these issues that that we need. Um, and so there's a lot of, I will say, I think North Carolina has been very successful because we, we were able to create the data systems quickly and we had the cooperation of many, many different partners. Um, I, I wanna very early on give a shout out to our hospital systems in North Carolina. Um, we worked super collaboratively through the last two years, and I don't think we could have been successful at responding to this. Um, every hospital, private, public, small, large, rural, urban, everyone really did um, play a role here, and I, I was very grateful for their support and how they came to support the public health departments, because if we let, had laid this at the feet of public health alone, um, it wouldn't. It was not possible. Um, we, we overwhelmed public health within minutes of, of this pandemic. Um, so I was grateful to them. And then they did things like get, you know, get to the table with us and frankly, give us resources and talent to help us build the data systems that we needed to get the visibility we needed. Um, so I think data is really, really important. I will say even at this time, I do not have the data I need um, in terms of understanding really where things are changing um, moment to moment with, with this pandemic. So almost two years in and we, are, we still feel like we have some big blind spots. Um, the second uh, I would mention is about what I call last mile execution. And for me, this goes back to who's in charge. What is the role? Who, who is in charge of all of this? Um, and what, particularly when you're in a crisis and at the very early on, you know, they're, they didn't feel like anyone was in charge. And so we at the state level said, okay, well, we are going to take the reins here, whether it was, we're going to run down and buy whatever ventilators we have, or we're gonna work with LabCorp that actually is housed here in North Carolina and we're gonna partner deeply with them on testing. Um, we are gonna run this at the state level. I'd say we were, we were very lucky, I think, in that we were structured in a way where I'm not just the public health director. And I think that was important. I'm the secretary of health and human services, which means I have public health, but I also have Medicaid, mental health, economic services. Um, and so we, by having that broad um, reach across many parts of uh, health and human services, that, that really benefited us. Thing that did not benefit us was our completely decentralized system, or both um, the way our healthcare system is incredibly fractured and siloed, and the fact that we have 83 local health departments in a state of 10 million people, that is way too many. Um, and while we had good coordination, I will not say that I think it was optimal in terms of how we distributed resources and how we responded to this pandemic. Um, we, for example, matured to a place where we could have zip code level race and ethnicity data. So we knew where we wanted to target testing or vaccines, but not everyone wanted to always play nice in the sandbox to say, I want to target resources in, in the, the same way that we wanted to. Um, and, and that I think slowed us down in being able to use our, our race and ethnicity data to, to respond at certain times. I think largely we were able to make a lot of strides, but um, I think governance in terms of executing on that last mile, are you gonna put a testing center in this zip code or that? Are you gonna go to the local church or are you gonna stay at the public health department and have people come to you? I think it's really, um, really important to think through as, I know we all have an instinct to say, absolutely, the public health system is underfunded, but I think we really have to examine who do we want to execute on the things that to, to provide um, response as we go forward and make sure we are resourcing um, those folks and that when we have a crisis, um, that those resources can be deployed in a, coordinated, in a coordinated way. I really don't think that was possible. The last point I'll make is about communication and trust. Um, that it is not lack of vaccines, it is not lack of, of data that is keeping us at a lower vaccine rate here in North Carolina. Um, it is trust. Um, it is trust amongst different communities have dif distrust for different reasons. Uh, here in North Carolina, I'm really proud that our, our vaccine rates in our African-American community is higher than in our white community. 
Um, and that took a lot of focused effort and time and um, making sure that we're partnering deeply and building trust with our Black African American community, with our Latino community. I'll say our Latino community is well outpacing both the African American and white communities here in North Carolina in terms of vaccination. And that was deep amount of engagement and trust over, over this pandemic to get there. But we see distrust in all different parts of our communities for different reasons. And I think that I don't have all the answers for that, but I think we have a lot of work to do both to connect people to a health system that can deliver for them in and out of crisis. Um, but I think it's also, how do we build up trust in science, in the media, in government institutions? It's all across the board, all of that, um, that that's gonna be important as we go forward. I'll stop there. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you. Secretary Shaw. Great, thank you. Thank you, George, as always, uh, to be a part of something with you. And, and thank you, Mandy, for, for the wonderful comments. Uh, it's great to be here this morning. And I actually, uh, I wish I was going prior to, to Mandy because I think she, she actually highlighted a quite significant uh, number of things that I was gonna bring into the mix. So let me provide some perspectives. Just as background, I am new to the state of Washington. Uh, for those of you who may know me, I was previously the Executive Director of Local Health Authority, Harris County Public Health, which was the county jurisdiction over Houston and third largest county in the US. And then uh, after 25 years in Texas, I made this transition in December of 2020 when Governor Inslee asked me to be the Secretary of Health for the great state of Washington. And uh, I arrived just at the week that vaccines arrived in the state of Washington. And so I will tell you, it was an incredibly challenging time to transition from what is called a so-called red state to a blue state, from local to state, and also from well across from hurricanes and heat, humidity to uh, you know, wet weather and mountains and, and all sorts of other things. And the approach that I brought, very similar to what I had at Harris County, were the three cornerstone values of equity, innovation, and engagement. And almost everything we've been doing has been around these three principles of equity, innovation, and engagement. And I think Mandy just really highlighted a lot of that in terms of both equity, innovation, but also of, of why engagement is so critical. I think one thing that we have to be thinking about when we think of Washington, we always think about Seattle, we always think about King County, we always think about you know a, a community that actually, by the way, is one of the most pro-vaccine, in fact, is one of the most vaccinated communities in the nation. And yet, when you go right actually far, just a little bit outside the jurisdictional lines of King County, uh, or you go over the mountains into east or central Washington, where Spokane and Walla Walla and Yakima, you start to see this incredible divide of, of really how people approach the world. Um, this has been a real challenge when you just heard about trust and you hear about how the public sector needs to work together to really assure that we have the data systems, we have the right data that we're looking at, but certainly communications and building the trust and the trusted messengers, not just the right message as we move forward. But I do think there is this real challenge that we have in Washington. We're closing in on 80% of our population has received at least, uh, eligible population has received at least one dose of vaccine, and we're well over 70% of our eligible population that is fully vaccinated. It's, it represents nine and a half million doses. That does not happen without an incredible amount of effort, energy, and, and true partnership. We do believe very strongly that, that it is very much about harnessing two things. One is this, this real this private sector partnership, which I, I do want to focus on for just a moment. Um, very early on, we brought together what we called um, the VAC Center, which was VACCS, Vaccine Action Command and Control Systems Center. Um, and the VAC Center was public-private partnership. It, it was a nationally recognized but what we realized is that the private sector was very interested in helping with the vaccine process, but we did not have all the, what's the word, input opportunities. We did not really have a good way to get the private sector 
plugged into what we were trying to do. So we created the VAC Center and the VAC Center then brought uh, the, you know, the, the incredible leadership, as you can imagine, of the Pacific Northwest. We're talking the Costco's and the Starbucks and the Amazons and the Googles and all sorts of other folks that came together. And it was really about when we had, for example, a long call center line of Q, uh, Amazon helped us work through what those uh, data systems needed to be to get uh, a digital response so we could get those uh, callers answered. When we had a mass vaccination site set up for vac mass vaccination sites across Washington, Starbucks showed up and they said, well, if we can get a latte in your hands 20% or 30% more efficiently, guess what? We can also help you get your mass vaccination sites 20 to 30 percent more effective more efficient and they did and those are two examples of how we have really partnered with the private sector the other of course is microsoft microsoft has been with us from day one with data systems and really analytics and really helping us with all sorts of other things as we moved along we realized it wasn't just the the vac center but it was also what i call the vix the VICS, the Vaccine Implementation Collaborative, which is very much about dialogue with communities that have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 to really make sure no matter who you were, where you live, where you were from, what you look like in the state of Washington, you had access to vaccines. And that was real that equity driven community conversations to bring that element of a voice to what the private sector was bringing really has allowed us to, and what I would say is to, is to be successful in the vaccine front. But we have a lot of challenges that, that, that come ahead of us here. As you know, with the uh, former Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Medicine, crisis standards of care, the trigger was pulled in Idaho, the trigger was pulled in Alaska. So here we are in Washington, right Again, thinking about Spokane, which is right across the border from Idaho, um, you had a lot of pressure from our healthcare institutions saying we need to pull crisis standards of care and in the state of Washington. Fortunately, I was on the IOM committee back in 2009 that de developed those standards and said, hey, guys, we're not there. And so just this week, we've uh, issued protocols for crisis standards of care. But I will tell you, the number one tenet of those protocols is to never have to implement them in the first place. So we're doing everything we can, even in the middle of Delta surge, to really support our healthcare system and work very closely with our healthcare system to make sure it's a public and, sorry, public health and healthcare system partnership. The last thing that I would say is that we need to be really thinking about the investment in public health. And I know you've heard that over the, the last few sessions. This, this underinvestment over the decades has really come to, uh, to fruition in the midst of a pandemic that has unearthed all of those inequities, unearthed all those antiquated data systems, unearthed those lack of partnerships, unearthed all the challenges when it comes to the investment in our workforce. We have to be thinking, what I say is that it should not be fighting this pandemic is transactional in nature, one and done, you fought it, you beat it, and you're done and you move on and let's go to the next shiny object or the next headline, but it should be transformational. We really need to be thinking about how those investments for the future today starting that are sustainable, strategic, and certainly uh, scalable are really going to allow us to build those systems so that we can transform health. So it's not just beating COVID, but it's utilizing COVID as an opportunity for the future. So with that, thank you so much. And I hope this is helpful. George's, I'll turn it back. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you both. So I'm going to bring you the, the, the two of you up and let's talk about where we go from here. Obviously, um, um, Umar, you, you talked a lot about the importance of trying to build the public health system. And I would argue that we actually know what we need to build. The question is, um, how do we keep the um, um, emphasis on this and actually try to build it? Uh, and Mandy, you talked about the the, the data systems. Uh, you know, earlier one of the panelists on a, another panel talked about the the, the a fair amount of money that was put into the uh, in data systems, uh, reminding everyone that it was all put into the healthcare side of the data system. 
It was not put into the public health side of the data system. So what do we need to do? Let's start with data um, and talk. I wanna talk about leadership data testing um, and then that old familiar contact tracing because that's a manpower workforce issue that really hasn't been talked about a lot. So what do we wanna do about leadership? I mean, how do, you know, in the future, how do we do this? This is not gonna be the last pandemic. In fact, this is not gonna be the last health threat that enters the community. Before we were doing COVID, we were doing opioids. Before opioids, we were doing, um, you know, a scan of measles outbreaks. So what do we do? Leadership. Yes. So maybe let me start with, I think there are a couple of things before you even get to the probably billions of dollars that are needed in terms of infrastructure investments. I think there's some easy, nothing is ever easy. So let me say that. But I think there are things we could do before we get to even like, what do we build next? Um, I think there's a couple of things, particularly because this conversations we've been, been focused on equity. I want to see leadership from the federal level and frankly, from every state level to say every program that we have from now on, you're going to get money from the federal government, from the state government, from grants, what you got to collect race and ethnicity data and you got to make that data transparent, right? That doesn't, you don't need to build a new system to do that. You have to say, I ha you have to ask all the time. Now, you can always allow the patient, the consumer, the whomever to say, I I'm, I'm not comfortable sharing and have that as an option. But for example, in North Carolina, you cannot log a vaccine in North Carolina unless you ask about race and ethnicity data. If the patient wants to not answer, totally fine again, doesn't keep them from getting the vaccine, but you can't do it. So there's like a there's just like a will thing on the equity data that I think we need to get to. That's one. Um, second is the boring, non-sexy thing around standards. So even before we build a system, Let's all just decide on what the definition is of someone being hospitalized with COVID <laughs> and what their vaccination status is. Like that's a question I have right now that my team has answered for North Carolina. I don't know what the answer is in Washington state. And so I don't know if our, we're even comparing apples to apples um, when, we're, when we're doing these things. So I think there's some unsexy standardization, uh, definitional things that we can do as well as set standards for how we wanna make this data interoperable that, folks have been working on for a long time. So those are the things. And then um, there are smarter people on this, including, I know John, I saw John Lumpkin um, from Blue Cross of North Carolina Foundation on here, who's done a ton of work on an electric, uh, on electronic case records and how we start to think about building a system that can capture actual clinical data that is going to be relevant for our ability to track and detect the next pandemic before it becomes it. Good point, good point. Umar, one of the questions in the chat is um, someone brought up the issue of trying to standardize uh, a better understanding of crisis standards of care. Again, that doesn't cost any money. That's about simply creating some under general understanding. So, A, people don't get overtreated or undertreated or, frankly, not treated at all. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, um, my colleagues, uh, Dan Hanfling and John Hick have been just incredible when it comes to crisis standards of care work, as well as James Hodge at Arizona State University from the legal side. And I will tell you that the one thing that was really the, the pressure that we had received was that hospitals or institutions or localities or communities or regions wanted to go it alone. And what they wanted to do was to pull the trigger on price standards of care themselves. And I made it very clear that we would go as a state, which is a principle that we've had since 2012 and 2015 in the state of Washington. I'm so proud of the, 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 the work that's been done here. But in the midst of crisis, people sort of forget that work. And so even though theoretically that's what we all agree to, when you're in the middle of a crisis and things are really bad in a healthcare system, a hospital might say, look, we're, we're, we're about to pull crisis standards of care. And what we said is be very careful of nomenclature, that crisis standards of care is very different than providing care in the midst of a crisis. That is not the same thing. So let's not get to that other aspect of pulling the trigger for, for example, rationing a ventilator because you don't have enough because of life-saving or life-threatening therapeutics that are that are really in the in the midst. So that was a real challenge. And that, George's, I think gets back to leadership because you know, ultimately I think I could have seen, obviously, I had some experience uh, because of the academies, 
about crisis standards of care, but I could have seen a, a situation where people would have said, well, the, the east side of the state, the rural side of the state, the, the site that doesn't have as many of those resources, perhaps we can pull those triggers. And no, 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 we said they are going to be pulled together as a statewide system. And that I think gets to that you have to be systematic about the approach to anything that happens, but we should also be sharing across the state. So one of the very neat things around crisis standards of care, back Back in 2009 with the letter report to the Obama administration and Nikki Lurie and all sorts of other you know, players at that time, and then certainly in 2012, and then later on in 2013 with the subsequent reports, was that there was sharing that was going to be happening across the system. And that sharing has to be re-energized because we need to have opportunities where Mandy is doing something and I can learn from it. I'm doing something and Mandy can learn from it. ASTHO does an incredible job with that, and so does NATO, by the way, from a local standpoint, but we have to have an opportunity to how do we bring those together. And so George is when APHA convenes people as you do and you're doing coming up, that is an opportunity like that. And you've done a fantastic job doing that, but we need to see more of that because we're in the middle of a crisis when everybody has their heads down. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Mandy talked, of course, about data. Um, and, and then there's, of course, the, the ability to actually capture that data so that you have an IT system that actually works. Um, and yes, we, we had health departments faxing things around because their made of communica mode of communication was fax machines. Um, right after 9-11, um, we had health departments that couldn't share information um, because they had to first get off of rotary telephones. Um, and we really, quite frankly, haven't, we've gotten off of rotary telephones, I believe in most places in the country, um, but we've not really done that, um, you know, create the, the, the data infrastructure that um, someone who is trying to get a, a, a car, you know, Uber or get some food at two o'clock in the morning can get, um, or as somebody said earlier, getting their um, um, radiology, um, information from, uh, you know, from one hospital to another. How do we build that system? And, and how do we convince people that that's important? You would think they would know that after this, this pandemic, but I'm not so sure. Well, I do want to bring up that uh, the, the technology exists, right? We know how to build the pipes. We know how to share, right? It, it's not a, can we do this? It, but I, I will remind you that it's not just the cost of the implementation of the system. It is, you actually have to change the way in which you do business when you have a new um, way of, of sharing data. And that is scary to a lot of people. And I will say that there's been a lot of resistance to changing the way in which we all do our work. And so I think we need to address the culture piece um, as well as that we really need to rethink, you know, we're gonna be doing our work differently with an underlying uh, different way of capturing data. So I think we all wanna go there, but then when the reality hits of like, ooh, this is hard and I actually have to retrain on this. Um, anyone who's been through an EHR implementation in their health system um, will know it's, it's dr dramatic, traumatic <laughs> um, for folks. Um, and and it, th these systems feel out of date, but the moment you put them in, right, because things are changing so much. So how do we also become, uh, make sure that whatever we're building can be modular, flexible, build for the future? Um, and look, I will share, uh, honestly, so I run um, a, a number of healthcare facilities in the state of, of North Carolina, state-run psychiatric hospitals. We do not have electronic health records in those hospitals. Right. So talk about. Right. So that's just even the health system getting to our, our public health system. Um, and the reason we haven't done it um, is is just, is one funding. So I think that's number one. Um, but second is also the this the the talent that is needed to implement these systems on the ground. So once we buy a thing, uh, do we have the, the talent needed to do it? And that's been a hard um, uh, thing to to manage at the state level with the kind of resources we have. Yeah, and then the, and the training on top of that, and clearly one of the things we have to think about is how do we build these systems sort of sustainable in the future? Because this yo-yo funding, where where something bad happens, they throw a lot of money at it, That's right. um, and then the problem goes away, the money goes away, um, the infrastructure and the capacity goes away. Uh, and then we're all mad and concerned about why, why it happened. And we know it's happened, it's happened 
every every 10 years or so it happens um, every time we have one of these. Yeah, George's, I, I think what I would also say is that one of the challenges we have is really these, these barriers that are at all levels, whether they're barriers that are, you know, cultural or linguistic or technology driven or social uh, elements such as housing or transportation. And we absolutely need to make sure that the very systems that are capturing all the health and, and the and the um, healthcare and public health data are also capturing those social data systems and social elements that come into the mix. So it's not, unfortunately in this country, we've, we've um, de-linked health and social and it's bringing health and social back into the system. And then if you talk to many of our communities, for example, the state of Washington has 29 tribal nations and they are very concerned about disaggregation of, of data. And then you, you look at our Latino communities and you look at communities across the spectrum, they're very concerned that our data systems across the nation are not robust enough to really allow the, the careful uh, placement of people in appropriate categories as we're capturing the very data that we need to capture to be able to, to, to have people see themselves in the data. And so we have to have a real community rooted approach to this that's not just about us top down putting these data systems together, but that really has an inclusive engagement approach. The very communities that are disproportionately impacted by this, this pandemic are also the communities, one, that we don't have good, good ability to count and have data system because our systems are not robust enough. And guess what? They're also the ones that are the, the targets, and I use that very deliberatively, targets of the misinformation and the, and the disinformation. And so here you have communities that are being targeted with that negative information and 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 can't always get the what is the right credible source of information and at the same time they don't see themselves in the data that are being captured and so it becomes a conundrum so we've got to really work through all of those elements as well dr shaw and, and, and cohen listen thank you very much that was a a very very important conversation i wish we had all day to talk about this because we as you know we could really really talk about this all day but we do have to move on um, and, and with thank that, you. thank you very, very much. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to bring on another of our, our good friends and colleagues, um, Dr. Sandra Galea. Um, Dr. Galea is the Dean of the um, Boston University School of Public Health, and he's going to introduce a very, very important conversation. Um, Sandra. Thank you, Georges. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I guess good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I uh, had the privilege of uh, talking with the CMS Administrator, Chiquita brooks Lashore. Um, uh, the administrator looks like could not make it with us this morning. So we taped the, the uh, conversation about uh, about a week ago, and I believe we're gonna run that tape. Now this requires some technical help that's beyond me. I'm Sandra Galea, I'm the Dean of School of Public Health at Boston University, and I'm uh, here with uh, Chiquita brooks Lashore, Administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where she also oversees Medicare, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Program, CHIP, and the healthcare.gov health insurance marketplace. Administrator Brooks Lashore, welcome. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. So I was wondering if, um, before we get into some specific questions, if you can talk a little bit the, about the big picture. And by the big picture, I mean around issues of health equity. And uh, we, you, you enter this position, obviously, at a time of enormous turmoil, COVID, mm -hmm. um, everything else in the world around us. And... Um, how do you see health equity being informing what you and your team have started to do and what you will be doing over coming years? I really appreciate the question about how are we incorporating health equity in our work. And as you alluded to, I think we are in an incredible moment in our country's history of health and certainly for the healthcare world that there is a new appreciation for how much our health disparities and health inequities affect not only the people who are affected by disparities, but also our country as a whole. And we've really seen that over the last year and a half with the COVID pandemic, just how systemic some of these issues are and how much they are ingrained in our healthcare system. So I have the privilege of being um, at the he head of CMS, which has responsibility for 
over 140 million lives in this country and in terms of their health care coverage. And we have an incredible role through those programs to advance uh, policies and, uh, and operational decisions that can affect health equity. So one of the things that we've done, certainly the president has really described the role of the government around equity as being a whole of government approach. And it is a priority at HHS and at CMS where we've outlined um, six pillars and health equity is the first one. And the way we are approaching it is asking how does this policy operational issue, everything that comes across our desk, how does how does this affect, how does it advance, how does it harm health equity, and what can we do to, to address it? And I would say just by the action of starting to put a spotlight in all of our decisions, whether it's on the Medicare program, whether it's thinking about um, how, what kind of demonstrations we're doing, it is really opening up eyes and opportunities to, to think differently. One of the first places, of course, is collecting data and reporting on that data. And over the last couple of months, we've started to report more and more information about how people uh, are, are enrolling and faring um, under the different programs, but really trying to make sure that as we, as we Push, push forward with new efforts, whether it's enrolling people, which has been a huge focus this year of enrolling through Medicaid chip and the special enrollment periods of making sure we're reaching underserved population and populations, putting a particular spotlight on that. And we started to outline our vision on the Innovation Center and what types of proposals we uh, are going to, what kind of demonstrations we're interested in looking forward to and promoting. And equity will be at the center of, um, center of our focus. Can you uh, talk a little bit about how taking a health equity lens might shift your legislative priorities in terms of, you know, how, how would your legislative priorities be formed because of health equity lens versus how would they not be if one weren't taking that lens? I would say it's it's multifold. And you asked um, about a legislation and the president has outlined in his Build Back Better agenda a robust focus. So I would say many of the pieces that are healthcare related, home and community-based services, of really making sure that people can get care where, um, where it, in the most appropriate setting. There are huge disparities in where, um, in, uh, in the Medicare, Medicaid uh, market, marketplace to some extent in terms of um, where people get care, right? So behavioral health. And we see huge disparities um, by racial lines in terms of uh, who ends up being institutionalized, for example. So that's just one example of really focusing on making sure that people are in the um, getting care in the appropriate setting. And I can't think of anything more um, uh, of a bigger disparity than uh, the coverage gap, people who are in states who have not expanded the Medicaid program. And so the uh, American Rescue Plan has put additional dollars on the table for states to come in and um, receive additional federal funding to cover the gap. We I was so fortunate to be able to celebrate with people from Missouri on their Medicaid expansion, was uh, in Oklahoma on the eve of and the dawn of their expansion and hoping that more states uh, take up those additional um, dollars. And then of course, uh, hoping that if uh, states decide not to expand, that Congress uh, decides to cover the coverage gap and, and make sure that people all across the country have access uh, to health insurance coverage. Let, let, let me get to specifics, thank you. And uh, I, I suspect that there probably is no greater health policy inequity at the moment than that caused by the failure of dozen, dozen or so states to implement ACA Medicaid expansion. Mm -hmm. And I know that legislation to pr provide a permanent pathway to coverage um, is part of the pending um, uh, human infrastructure bill. So I was wondering if you can comment a little bit about that and also about plans the administration might have to try to engage states 
that continue to sort of reject the 2010 expansion? Well, we continue to, in terms of our role at CMS, we will be ready to implement uh, whatever legislation that Congress passes. And so we are very focused on uh, following uh, the congressional discussions and we will be ready um, if they do in fact uh, cover the coverage gap to uh, and, and have a, a, a federal program and we will implement that. On the state side, we are constantly in conversations with states about their Medicaid programs and for those states that run their own uh, marketplaces and strongly um, urge all states uh, who have not yet expanded to do so. And we uh, have an open door in terms of our dialogue, encouraging states to come in. So let's talk about specific states and specific communities some more, because I think one of the lessons from the pandemic is that some healthcare systems and some communities are thriving while mm -hmm. others sort of seem to be on life support. I was wondering if you had any comments on that about how, I mean, how can CMS help deploy its resources? How can CMS um, jump in to help rebalance some of these fundamental systemic inequities? I would say that some of our uh, authority comes from um, our ability to implement demonstrations and waivers. So uh, certainly at the state level, sometimes states come in um, with proposals and uh, really thinking about making sure that we are supporting the safety net providers. And I see that as a, a focus for the Innovation Center. So working with um, Liz Fowler, who's the head of that center, as uh, and th as we think about the demonstrations uh, that uh, the authority to do something different, we are really focused on making sure that providers in underserved areas are really included as we think about, especially as we move to more value-based care, we need to make sure that the underserved, um, the, the providers that serve the underserved, right? So not just the people, but also the providers are able to take advantage of some of these opportunities. And sometimes it may be that maybe uh, they need more technical assistance or help in terms of making sure they're taking advantage of, um, uh, of some of the flexibilities that's, that CMS can offer. Uh, and that's one particular area. I would say another uh, area of focus is really around um, Medicare more generally. And a lot of our authority comes directly from Congress um, and Congress sets those rules, but to the extent that we have administrative flexibility in terms of really thinking about uh, making sure that the underserved uh, uh, providers are getting um, the access, whether it's in rural areas or in urban areas where uh, those particular providers are serving the underserved. Yeah, let me build on that for a second, because uh, you, um, I mean, the, the scope of programs that you administer is really extraordinary. And uh, in some respects, you have programs that are both serving as insurance, mm -hmm. insurers of more than 150 million kids and adults, but also you're driving purchases purchasers of healthcare. Is there anything in comment about the levers that are particular to those two functions, both as an insurer and driving and as a purchaser of healthcare and, and how you can push those levers towards improving health and narrowing health gaps? Uh, so such an important question. So I would say we have multiple levers. Um, one, many of the people that are served under programs operating that CMS in, uh, overseas are in health plans. So whether it's Medicare Advantage, whether it's in Medicaid managed care, whether it's in marketplace place coverage, health plans are uh, a, a, a huge partner in terms of the lives that are covered. And so one piece of that is certainly measuring what we care about. So are our quality measures measuring um, uh, the things that, that we we value as a society. And that is, again, one place where we are very focused on making sure we're collecting data. Uh, and so we can inform whether we start to pay differently, whether we um, see disparities that need to be addressed, whether it's through, um, uh, through our different uh, um, reporting mechanisms or whether it's through our our efforts to pay for 
performance and things along those lines. And then, um, and the same on the fee for service side, I would say in Medicare in this sense of making sure, and one, uh, one of our big focuses is on the, our, the quality of our reporting. So whether it's around um, vaccinations with, um, with COVID-19, whether it's on um, maternal mortality and maternal health, whether it's on behavioral health, really making sure that we are collecting data and um, measuring whether there need to be need to be adjustments is is a place and there we're much more directly measuring with providers uh, what's happening uh, to the populations that are being served can we um thank you let's talk for a second about the social determinants of health broadly speaking that bucket of social determinants of health it's a term which i don't love but nonetheless it's um it, we, we know what we mean uh, and, and a lot of the health equity conversation, as you know, is around social terms of health, around the sort of education and housing and, and all that. Can you comment a little bit about how CMS is intersecting with a social determinants of health agenda and where you see that going in the coming years? Yes, I would say that I, there's so much more. There's always been, but, you know, there has been some discussion about the need to integrate uh, the bigger picture uh, of what is happening with people on the ground when thinking about how to address healthcare. And part of that, I would say, really comes from us working um, really closely with our partners. So certainly the other agencies at CMS, uh, sorry, at HHS, as well as in the rest of the, uh, the, the administration. So one piece of that is, I would say, really making sure that these various programs are are complementary, and I'll give you an example in just a second. And then more broadly, um, there is some flexibility within the various programs for there to be some uh, within, you know, some um, uh, some level for Medicaid and for uh, for the Medicare program, particularly through uh, Medicare Advantage, to cover some of these what well, these additional social determinants of health type. Um, uh, 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 um, activities and and costs, but uh, just to draw out a specific example around maternal health, there is um, flexibility certainly within you know this is an area of particular focus for me for the agency and for um, the government as a whole to really address those issues. Well, there is a part of um, the Medicaid program pays for a number of births. Uh, in some states, 50% of the births uh, are covered by the Medicaid program. And so, uh, you know, a huge payer in terms of, uh, of trying to address um, those issues. Well, there are also other programs that contribute, like states get grants for maternal health. Um, and can we, the government, can we at the federal level, can we at the state level do more integration of those types of programs to make sure that they are complementary? So, um, for example, doulas um, and uh, other types of care really make a huge difference in maternal uh, health outcomes and outcomes for children. Can they be better coordinated uh, as, as those programs are being operated? Oh, thank you. Well, just to add layers of complexity, then let's move now to public health. So, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, the the moment has the moment has taught us many things. But one of the things that taught us is the need to make sure that the public health system and the health delivery system, to call it that, are integrated. Can you just talk a little bit about where you see CMS headed in that regard, and and what you think is feasibly done to better integrate healthcare delivery, healthcare financing, and public health and public health function? It, this is such an important issue, and I think, again, over the last year or so, we've had just a different understanding of where, of the impact of these, um, these gaps in our, in our health care. And one of the things we've all made as a priority in the administration is thinking about how to better integrate, and some of it is about around topics like maternal health, like behavioral health. It's also, um, uh, so so really trying to, and certainly I should say, and around COVID, so making sure that our, um, 
uh, that our efforts on the, again, in the administration, on the CDC and the FDA side are, of course, integrated with what's happening at HRSA and SAMHSA and CMS. But I would say part of that also is about learning to speak the same language. And we've brought on um, in our own team um, more expertise uh, in the public health world to really help us as CMS to look for ways that we can better link uh, the financing world, as I often call it, with the public health world. Can we, um, we have only a few minutes left, so I want to talk aspirational for a second. Um, can you talk about what will it take for us to head in the right direction on health equity? Meaning, what will it take for us to minimize health gaps as much as possible as a country? Like, are we, are, can, can we get there? Well, I think that we, the only choice is to work towards our goal. And we will need to do that. And when we say, how do we get to health equity? I, there are so many issues that are bigger than the role um, that we have, I have at CMS, but we have some pretty powerful levers. And we as a healthcare industry have really powerful le levers together if we're moving in the same direction. And you know, we didn't even define health equity, and it's um, one of these things where there is a lot of talk about what we need to do in health equity, but do we have a shared perspective on what that means? And I think part of it is really getting the healthcare world to really have a shared vision of where we need to be. And where I would start was saying that we need to have people in health care coverage. It is not it is a necessary but not sufficient part of health equity. It's really difficult to talk about truly addressing um, the differences in, in care and treatment without uh, really making sure that we have people covered. And we have, as you know, a significant gap there, which hopefully will be, um, will be closed. I call it the unfinished work of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. So that, to me, is just a baseline part of what we have to do to get to health equity. But again, that's not enough. So I, as a black woman um, uh, in studies, is five I'm five times more likely to have a, a bad maternal outcome than a woman, a white woman with, without a high school degree. That's not about coverage. That's not about... Um, income even, that is something different. And that is what we need to address for us to truly address health equity. And that is going to take really taking a hard look at what kinds of, um, uh, what kinds of interventions are happening. Why are the ones um, that we know to be effective? Why are they not happening for certain populations? Are we, are we addressing these underlying conditions? So it's an ambitious agenda but um, one that I think that we all must commit ourselves to. Okay. Last question then. What, um, what would you like a forward-looking CMS to be like? What would you like to, to leave when you've, um, when you've made the mark that you want to make on, uh, on CMS? I would like to leave CMS with the coverage gap filled with us at record enrollment in all of the programs. Um, and that CMS will be um, would be a place where the three M's, as I like to say, are integrated, where um, there is a common vision. And even if it looks different in the various programs, that we were moving in a direction across all of them to uh, promote care for people in a way that addresses health equity. It seems like a worthwhile vision indeed. Um, thank you, Administrator Brooks Lashore. Thank you for uh, talking and uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Well, hi, everyone. Let me um, bring them um, to our phase of, for um, a kind of a summary discussion our Vice Chair, uh, Dr. Neil Poe, who is at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Poe. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Um, this was a wonderful session. I want to thank our moderators, 
uh, and panelists for their wonderful uh, uh, insights. Um, and I'll just summarize a few of the themes that we heard and then uh, perhaps our panelists will uh, answer some additional questions that uh, people put in the chat. Um, so, you know, we started out uh, hearing from Elizabeth about the failures and the successes of not only our healthcare system, but our public health uh, uh, system. Um, and what the lessons we might learn from that might be. And then we, um, you know, we, we heard from Leo about uh, the atrocious uh, uh, healthcare disparities that were observed in Louisiana and, and how uh, the, the COVID epidemic uh, disproportionately affected African Americans and how the social determinants of health uh, were really uh, important. Um, and he pointed to the, uh, the how though this has accelerated the efforts uh, for, uh, uh, to address health inequities um, in a number of ways uh, in the Oshner uh, uh, system. And then we heard from David Ash. Uh, David uh, really hammered home the importance of the social determinants of health and that why is, why are we telling the same old story that we have uh, you know, been talking about uh, for years and urging us to think about the communities and the way that our communities are structured and how that affects the healthcare system. And then we heard, uh, you know, from Amundo about the huge digital divide that, that not only is devices, but broadband access and digital literacy and how we might address, use, use uh, tools, uh, particularly uh, artificial intelligence to address them. And then Madeline told us, you know, about the impact of, of COVID on, um, on, on youth, our, our children in the community, and how um, CHOP reached out and uh, reached out into community to address things like nutrition and behavioral health uh, and knowledge support, as, as, as she uh, uh, called it. And then we heard from Mandy about the data vacuum and how that was uh, such a critical piece uh, in, you know, in North Carolina and how um, leadership really needs to step in uh, to have agreement about where to put resources in, in the and, and working with the community to, to deploy those resources. And then we heard from Umar, um, you know, about equity uh, in uh, in innovation, and uh, uh, and part of that is how our community trust. Uh, healthcare and public health professionals, uh, and um, how working in partnership with uh, industry uh, that uh, great things were achieved uh, uh, in in Washington State. Um, and then um, uh, in this last uh, interview that Sandro did with uh, Administrator Lashore. I mean, really dressed uh, very important ways to look forward uh, and try to get hands around health uh, equity. It was wonderful to hear Administrator Source say that health equity is one of the six uh, pillars and that they think about it whenever they uh, uh, are thinking about any new or, or, or reform of any existing policies. Um, we heard, I think, at the end, her recognition of the linkages between public health and healthcare uh, financing and how that has to be integrated. And while CMS can't do it all alone, they're very cognizant 
of the levers they can they can put in place to catalyze uh, uh, reform. So that was um, that was a brief summary of our uh, our of our wonderful session. Um, and what I think I will do is um, I ask some questions um, that came up uh, in the chat and maybe address them to groups of people. We had a question um, about uh, the conundrum regarding setting standards, say at the state level, and then pulling along the local uh, county systems. So how does one deal uh, with that vision in states where public health perspectives are made secondary to state level politics? Maybe our, our health officials could uh, opine uh, about that question. Anyone? So this is Umair um, Washington. I'll thank you for that, and I'll, you know, I'll just maybe make a couple of quick comments and say that, you know, this is really where public health is inherently political, and I think the challenge that we've had is this real. You know, while we as, let's say, practitioners, healthcare providers, scientists, uh, however you want to label, uh, we oftentimes feel that, you know, that should ride the day, that should rule the day. And we have found during this pandemic that it has been far from that. It has really been about all those other skills that oftentimes we don't learn in our training that we're not as comfortable with engaging in, that, that sometimes social media is a very unfortunate place to be, but also a necessary place to be. And so I think it's really an opportunity for us to be thinking about what do we need to even be teaching as skills for the next generation of leaders that are coming through the system. I certainly know in med medical school and residency, uh, and even during my MPH, and I thought they were all great training grounds that I didn't learn those skills. And yet those are the actual skills that really come into play in the midst of uh, a pandemic when or beyond when people, uh, and I say pandemic and beyond because let's say, let, look at climate change. It's a very similar, <laughs> similar concept. There, there are people that believe and don't believe and there's you know that whole, whole so this is not going to stop when COVID-19 ends. This is gonna continue. We just have to be markedly more nimble and resourceful, but also adept at not just our own skills, but also how do we teach those skills to the next generation from an educational standpoint. And I, and I just think that that is another key. I know you were asking from a different perspective, but I just thought I should really encapsulate that because leadership is not just something that you come up with um, in the middle of a crisis. You have to really help uh, hone it and develop it over time as well. Well, thank you for that. Let me move to another question that came from the chat that I don't think people address today, and that's the post-traumatic stress for paid uh, caregivers. Uh, and that stress among providers is downstream, a downstream effect of the crisis-based decision-making without uh, strong leadership endorsement and, and guidance. And many of the folks watching today could implement support systems and guidance that could heal and change this going forward. Uh, would any of our healthcare executives uh, uh, or others uh, chime in on, on this issue that of, of post-traumatic stress among providers, which I think is affecting you know, employment and the availability of uh, providers? Neil, Brendan brought this issue up, but I just wanted to say, I mean, our fellows, residents, students are, and nurses are traumatized, they had to, hold up an iPhone, you know, to, with a family while that, uh, to the family, watch that uh, family member die and they were the only one in the room. And that was unprecedented to not have the resources, to have to put your mask in a paper bag as my staff had to do, wondering if that actually worked to save your life, have to go home to family members, wondering if you'd give them COVID. Um, so I, you know, I really need, think we need to fundamentally re-engineer how we create resiliency. And that starts with self-care. What are we doing in medical schools and nursing schools, allied health schools to teach people how to care for themselves? Um, what are we doing um, to do after action reviews? I, I wrote with Diane Meyer about this. When you have something horrible happen, 
uh, in safety in a community, a mass shooting, we help people bring them together and say, how do we help you? We don't do that with healthcare workers. We assume you're a tough guy or gal and you'll manage it on your own, but I really think this needs to change. Thank, thank you. Um, so we, we have another uh, point actually, Re Rebecca, that you brought up is that COVID uh, should be the 9-11 public health equivalent. Um, and the near immediate transformation that happened to counter terrorism post 9-11 has not happened with the same uh, force in public health post COVID. And so there's needed structural changes in the availability and content of data as men mentioned by many of the panelists. And the NAMS, you know, National Academy's culture of health program is trying to address those structural issues. And I guess the question is how, how how can we best share practices more readily so uh, we can uh, catalyze change uh, more effectively? Neil, can I make a comment? Uh, this is Lee Fleischer from um, Chief Medical Officer at CMS, and we, we actually did start to analyze what systems did really well and what systems did poorly in the pandemic, and, and those that were connected that um, better, as particularly the small systems to the larger systems, had a, a very profound difference in, in those outcomes. So I think as we look at the system, and we're trying to work closely with the CDC on this, how do we reconnect the system? Because several people brought up the difference in resources, and how do we make sure sort of the resource-intensive places are able to help the resource less intensive places post pandemic. So we're thinking about it at least at a federal level. And I look forward to hearing how others think about it. Thank you. Neil, Lee, thanks. I think, and Elizabeth brought up a beautiful point, uh, Court Larry, earlier, which is you don't tell a cruise ship, well, why don't you get safety boats, you know, uh, just because um, you'll make a decision if you want to do that or upgrade your, your dining room. No, you have to have uh, safety boats. And similarly, we should have a national informatics system now that, that when the next virus comes, we're able to identify it, have action teams uh, that are cross-pollinate across the country. When there are best practices, they need to be shared. Those things have not happened. Um, there are people like Charity Dean who started the public health company, hoping the private sector will do it. But I really think we, um, as members of the National Academy, need to get together to say, look, how do we change this going forward? What is the uh, immediate solution because it's unacceptable that Mandy Cohen still doesn't have her data. That's that was the truth. That was truth when I was health, health secretary. Years later, post-COVID, it's even more unacceptable now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I don't think Madeline is still with us, but if, if she is, there, there was a question uh, that came up or a comment that I think hasn't been addressed, that um, there's deep concern for children who have lost parents. And those numbers are staggering and generation shifting. Are there any thoughts on more robust uh, bereavement services? And, uh, you know, since this has affected, uh, you know, minority communities more, what are the effects of that on generations to come? Any comments if Madeline's here or, or others? No one wants to take that one on. I, I can express something that is of concern to me, concern sure. that relates to this and relates to virtual medicine. Something we're seeing a lot at uh, KHN is that I really worry about a lot of um, online mental health services as if they are as meaningful as sitting in a room. And I, I think we, we really need to think about um, you know, it's about getting people better connected into a system. So when a parent dies or both parents die or because, um, you know, vaccine uh, hesitancy and non-masking is prominent in certain communities, it's often, it could be both parents and a grandparent and, you know, a bunch of people. And I think just having kids and parents plugged into a system that they think cares about them. And it really worries me with, um, and I think 
you know, there are many underexploited areas of virtual medicine and telemedicine, but I really feel like that personal connection to a provider is the key to all of this um, or to a system where a family trusts, a, a, a kid can trust. Um, I, it's just, you know, getting a video video call is is not the same thing. So. <laughs> Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for, for opening and then closing uh, with your last comment. Um, so I just, again, want to thank every, uh, all the moderators, panelists, and, and, the, and our commentators uh, for this session on health policy and healthcare care uh, systems. Um, uh, we will end now. We'll have a short break. And remember that the next round of interest group sessions will begin at 1.45 p.m. Eastern. Um, so thank everybody, and I hope you really enjoyed the session. I certainly did. All clear. Thank you, guys. MC, thank you very much. That went quite smoothly. I appreciate everything. Absolutely. Neil, if you're still there, thank you, of course, sir. You may be gone. All right. George, thank you for taking that over. I'm, I'm going to be at um, in Denver, and I hope to be able to see you uh, next week. Yep, I'll be there. So, Bells on my toes. Good, 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 good. Hi, right, everyone. <laughs>